And I would invite you to read this week at St. Paul's, our, the weekly newsletter that comes with your bulletin. It really has, has all the news fit to print. So I encourage you to read that every week. And now I'd just like to take a moment in prayer before we start the, uh, the worship service. So if we take a, a deep breath, settle into our space here. Dear God, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for the pastors at the New York Annual Conference that put together this beautiful worship service that we are about to enjoy. We thank you for the conference leadership that recognizes that being a pastor was never an easy task. It certainly hasn't gotten easier during this pandemic. We thank you for the dedication of our pastors, particularly our pastor Betty. And we ask you God to bless the offerings we bring to you. Bless our financial gifts, as well as our gifts of time and prayer. As we bring our offerings to you, we give back to you from the abundant blessings that you have given us. Use our gifts to further your kingdom in this world. Amen. And now, without further, I'm going to start the, uh, the video from the New York Annual Conference. <laughs> We are here, Jesus, we are here, Jesus, we are here. Come to me, all that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. With those words of Jesus, we are invited into our time of worship. If you are like me, weary and carrying heavy burdens are apt descriptors of how we're feeling just now. We are made weary by the efforts required to live in the midst of this pandemic. We are made weary by a longing for connection and touch. Made weary by the vigilance and precautions that love of neighbor demands of us made weary by the grief and loss of this past year. We are also carrying heavy burdens, especially those burdens related to the persistent and systemic racism that continues unabated in our nation and our church. During this time of worship, we lend our voices and our ears to the hymn, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far on the way, Thou who hast by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path we pray. This is Transfiguration Sunday, when we find ourselves with Jesus on a mountaintop with Peter, James, and John. May we experience a deep connection with Christ and one another as we pray. God of Transformation, we come together as those who have met you on the mountaintop. We have each had our holy encounters with you, and in those moments, we wanted to stay on the mountain and retreat from the world. We know that this is our longing, not yours. So as we offer ourselves this day in response to your blessings in our life, remind us that our mission begins as we leave this time of worship and help us hold our memories of those mountain type encounters with you in our hearts. We pray boldly in Jesus' name. Amen. New York Annual Conference, welcome to this time of worship.
Nichols was serving Salem Methodist Church in Harlem when he was elected the first African-American bishop of the newly formed United Methodist Church in 1968. A devoted social justice advocate, Bishop Nichols provided compassionate leadership throughout his career. In 1982, as bishop of the New York Annual Conference, he gave its ordination sermon. Take the truth. Whatever amount you have learned, as God clarifies it, and invest it in the world, in the issues that affect the lives of people, their pain and their joy. And the linkage of a life like that fulfills the expectation of Jesus when he said, Ye are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So be it. This is my soul. Just as the Spirit sent the saints of our past, the Spirit sends us today. Together, we reveal Christ to the world. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and does not keep silence. Before whom is a devouring fire, round about whom is the mighty storm. God calls to the heavens above and to the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare God's righteousness. For God alone is judge. La lectura bíblica hoy nos viene del apóstol Marcos, capítulo 9, versículos 2 al 9. Estoy leyendo de la versión Nueva Internacional. Seis días después, Jesús tomó consigo a Pedro, a Jacobo y a Juan, y los llevó a una montaña alta, donde estaban solos. Allí se transfiguró en presencia de ellos. Su ropa se volvió de un blanco resplandeciente como nadie en el mundo podría blanquearla. Y se les aparecieron Elías y Moisés, los cuales conversaban con Jesús. Tomando la palabra, Pedro le dijo a Jesús, Rabai, qué bien estamos aquí. Podemos levantar tres albergues, uno para ti, otro para Moisés y otro para Elías. No sabía qué decir porque todos estaban asustados. Entonces apareció una nube que los envolvió, a la cual salió una voz que dijo, Este es mi Hijo amado, escúchenlo. De repente cuando miraron a su alrededor ya no vieron a nadie más que a Jesús. Mientras bajaban de la montaña, Jesús les ordenó que no contaran a nadie lo que habían visto hasta que el Hijo del Hombre se levantara de entre los muertos. Esta es la palabra de Dios para nosotros, el pueblo de Dios. Gracias a Dios. Yosewi 이는 그들이 몹시 무서워하므로 그가 무슨 말을 할지 알지 못함이더라. 마침 구름이 와서 
그들을 덮으며 구름 속에서 소리가 나되 이는 내 사랑하는 아들이니 너희는 그의 말을 들으라 하는지라 문득 둘러보니 아무도 보이지 아니하고 오직 예수와 자기들 뿐이었더라 그들이 산에서 내려올 때에 예수께서 경고하시되 인자가 죽은 자 가운데서 살아날 때까지는 본 것을 아무에게도 이르지 말라 하시니 This is a word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Mark chapter 9 verses 2 through 9 Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. <laughs> he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one was with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this service today. We've designed this day as a way for us to enable our pastors to take a respite. We know that there's been uh, an unusual amount of pressures put on our pastors given the COVID pandemic, and we felt that it was important to give them a break. So this service and this sermon is that opportunity for us to find a way to uh, give them that rest that they need. They've kind of been through it, and I know you have too. These are difficult and challenging days. And so um, I just wanted to thank you again for giving me the opportunity to speak in your church today and to give me the chance to say that even as I'm trying to work with our pastors to give them a needed break, I'm also praying for you and hoping that we can find our way through these uh, days of uncertainty with renewed hope and joy as we look ahead. I have two scriptures that I'd share with you today. The first is from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 and then 6 through 14. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at the distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? Elisha replied, Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. And Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the, the, took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. 
When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and Elisha crossed over. The second passage is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the, that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you for whatever more you spend. And then Jesus said, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So here's the scenario. Perhaps a vision of, pre, of a pre-COVID world that I can once again conjure up in your mind. You go to a restaurant. You order steak, well done, baked potato, salad with Italian dressing and unsweetened iced tea. After a while, your waitress returns. She places ice water in front of you, your salad, and a little container of French dressing. You notice that you don't have Italian dressing, but French instead. Well, no one's perfect. I don't mind French. That'll be a nice shift. I think I'll eat that. In a little while, your main course comes. Boy, it looks really good. But then reality sinks in. Blood is oozing from your well-done steak, and you got French fries instead of a baked potato. Waitress, uh, uh, excuse me, I think I ordered my steak well done with a baked potato. I don't think you did, she says. I'm sure I did, you reply. Can you take it back? Well, I suppose so, she says. And she walks away rolling her eyes. Or you go to a store to buy a new set of tires. You get the guarantee, the warranty, and the receipt for your purchase. You notice from the guy's name tag that his name is John. Three weeks later, while driving to work, your left front tire blows out for no reason. You take your car over to the tire place, and the first thing John says to you is, have you got your warranty and the receipt? <laughs> well, no, I don't. It's at home. My blowout happened this morning on the way to work. John points at the sign on the wall and says, all returns must be accompanied by a receipt. And you say, but John, don't you remember me? I was just in here. Can't you look it up on your computer? Listen, buddy, can't you see we're busy in here? How can I remember every face? Bring me the receipt and we'll deal with it. Well, you know, these are not isolated stories these days. Have you noticed? People are pretty snarly. They're on edge these days, impatient, short-tempered, critical of everything. When times get tough, many people dive inward. I have to take care of myself. And before you know it, we're so focused on me that we've forgotten about we. When was the last time you heard someone say, what may I do for you and really mean it? When was the last time you said, 
the same thing. What may I do for you? In the Old Testament lesson that was read just a few minutes ago, there's this amazing story of the prophet Elijah. He was the head leader of the day, the big cheese, the chairperson of the board, the majority leader. He was the most looked to person for a prophetic voice of his day. There was no doubt that throughout the land that this was the authoritative representative of Almighty God. This was a man of God. This was a worker of miracles. He was the kind of person that when he came into your presence, you'd leave with your mouth open in amazement at what he can do and how much he could effectively relay God's word to you. This was undeniably a man of God. One day, this powerful person of God took his understudy, his assistant, Elisha, on a walk. Elijah was fully aware that his time had come, that this would be his last walk with the one who would carry on his tradition. Elisha looked up to this man. Elijah was his mentor, the one he looked to for strength and guidance for the right words and the right actions. He wouldn't move or say or do anything without the direction of Elijah. Elisha would do anything, anything for Elijah. Now, keep in mind that Elijah was God's representative, the big cheese, the head spokesperson for the Almighty. So there's this big meeting along the Jordan River. Elisha goes with him and there are 50 people that are hoping to hear great things, marvelous things, unbelievable miracles from the great prophet. They are clinging to this guy's every word and none more than Elisha. But on that day, in that moment, the big cheese looked at the understudy and said, what may I do for you? Come again, Elijah. I don't think I understood you. What did you say? What may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Oh, Elijah, you've got to be mistaken. I should be the one saying those words to you, for you are so great and I am nothing. No, Elisha, my day has come and passed. And you are now the one to carry on the work. I want to see to it that you carry the word. My son, what may I do for you? Oh, Elijah, I want to be just like you. And Elijah said, Elisha, if it be God's will and you see me caught up in the whirlwind into heaven, then you will know that your wish has been granted. And you know what? Scripture says, Elisha saw it. On that day, the big prophet showed his true colors. On that day, Elijah was a servant to all. There was another day. A day when Jesus told a parable in response to someone asking him how he could inherit eternal life. And Jesus told a story, a parable, about a dangerous road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Less than 20 miles long, yet the road dropped from 2,300 feet above sea level to 1,300 feet below sea level. It was a happy hunting ground for murderers and robbers. It had a long history, so much so that when the psalmist wrote the 23rd Psalm, he referred to a certain place on that Jericho road. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. There was such a place on that very road. On that day, Jesus said a man was beaten up on the road and robbed and left by the wayside to die. Along came a priest, a great man who saved souls. He looked at the man, made an excuse, and passed by. Along came a Levite, a good man. He looked at the beaten soul, made an excuse, and passed by. Finally, along came a Samaritan, a person, a race detested a race despised by the people of that region. The most detested, despised individual of that day looked at the man lying on the side of the road and helped him. He and he alone was prepared and willing to sacrifice himself and help. On that day, he simply said, what may I do for you? 
On that day, a small, lonely, despised man showed his true colors. On that day, he was a servant to all. You know, in the most amazing fashion, our Bible illustrates to us the fact that both the highly esteemed to the lowly despised are all called to do the very same thing. From the high to the low, everyone is called to be a follower of God and a servant to all. Our Bible illustrates that sometimes, oftentimes, the most unlikely candidates for servanthood will be the ones that are actually called upon and led to act. I think of former President Jimmy Carter, who has spent most of his former presidency working on homes for Habitat for Humanity. Who would have expected that? I think of my own father, dealt with the blow of breaking his neck, losing the use of his hands, getting COVID, quarantined from his family, falling and getting a concussion, having his kidney dialysis at one point fail. This very man saying to me, his son, I consider myself to be really blessed. When, when I have a daily opportunity to witness to the staff of my rehab center the love of God in my life, I feel like I'm the most blessed person around. And as a result, given all that we are facing, the COVID outbreak, the economic downturn, the racial unrest, the uncertainty about the future of the church, the issues that we're called to speak about and address, who would reasonably expect people like us to lower ourselves and help someone in need? We've got a lot going on. Who would expect us to lower ourselves and help someone in need? Well, I have an answer for you. Jesus would. Jesus would expect that very thing from us because Christ calls us to the love of God in our hearts. Jesus says, you ask, who is my neighbor? How far does that responsibility go? And I will tell you, your neighbor is a person who needs help even if she brought the trouble on herself. Your neighbor is the desirable and the undesirable, the one you like and the one you dislike, the one with whom you agree and the one with whom you disagree. To put it simply, your neighbor is anyone and everyone. But how is that possible? Isn't that a pie-in-the-sky idealism? Well, sure it is. But the gospel of Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life he taught and lived, and the way in which we, in turn, are called to live, is pie-in-the-sky idealism for many people. It's perceived as being out of touch, irrelevant, and unachievable. How can love be a requirement when we seem to be in such chaos? How can we be spontaneous and voluntary in our life if everything is so constrained and scripted? How can we reach a point of desiring and caring for the well-being of all when some of those all have no regard or respect for us? I personally believe that it's only possible with an inner transformation of your heart. It starts with a conviction a conversion of heart and soul, and an inner attitude that you and I will be different. You see, it starts right here. Love moves in three clear directions. From God to us, from us to God, and from us to others in the name of God. We love because God first loved us. We love because it's a reflection of God loving us. No human being on the face of the earth is beyond the range of love because no human being is outside of God's love. I know that's a hard concept to embrace because our love is limited. We're human. But you need to be reminded, even as I remind myself, God's love is never limited. So think about the one who suffers. Put yourself in their place. Imagine their pain. How wonderful would it be to have someone say to you, how may I help you today? There once was a pastor who was puzzled by a shabby old man who would come into her church every day and almost as soon as he arrived, he would leave. One day, the pastor confronted the man. 
what are you doing when you come into our church and almost immediately leave? And the man said, I pray. Come on, really? Yeah, the man said. I just go into church and say, Jesus, it's Jim. It's just a little prayer, but I figure God hears me. Well, as you know, as things turned out, Jim got sick and had to go to the hospital. There, Jim made all of the grumbly patients happy. Laughter filled the hallways. The supervising nurse said, they all say that you're always cheerful. Jim's reply was, well, yes, I am. You see, I can't help but be cheerful. It's because of my visitor. The nurse was puzzled. She knew that Jim never had any visitors. His room was always empty. So the nurse said, Jim, when does the visitor come? And Jim said, oh, he shows up every day at noon. He comes and stands by my bed, just stays for a few seconds. I see him, he smiles, and he says, Jim, it's Jesus. That's it. That's all it takes, really. A conscious awareness that you are in the presence of God. A reality check that the partnership between you and the Almighty is a source of strength, inspiration, and guidance on a road that often feels like the valley of the shadow of death. You see, it may be very elementary to some, but I know in my heart, and I long for you to know in yours, that Jesus very simply says to us today, what may I do for you? It may just sound crazy to you, but the key to servanthood lies in being reminded every day that Jesus walks with us and calls us daily to love others just as Jesus loves you. There's no doubt, times are tough. This has been a really difficult period of time. Issues are real, oppressions are great, illness is debilitating, uncertainty drives us crazy. But can you see at all today how very blessed you are? How very blessed we are? For everything working against us, there is one who is always working for us. For everything that is an obstacle, I believe there's a subsequent opportunity. A young man once complained to his pastor about the state of the world. He ended up by saying, I wish I could make a better world myself. The pastor looked at him and replied, that's exactly what God wants you to do. Oh God, open my eyes that I may see you more clearly. Open my ears that I may hear you in my midst. And open my heart that I may love others as you love me. You see, it's as simple as this. What may I do for you? May it be so. Amen.
God of promise, God never changing. There is no one like you in all the earth. Dios de Won't you pray with me? Loving God, we pause now to remember those stories that are all around us, but so often passed over. Those stories that when told are shared because of what someone is, not who they are. This is Black History Month. Well, help us to realize that Black history is all our histories. Make the day come when these stories are so widely taught that no month need be separately divided. We know this day will not come until we as a people make different choices. We pray now for those new choices. May we come to see a day when the prison system becomes redemptive, not punitive. A day where the legal system learns to focus more squarely on the facts and not the color of our skin. A day where our schools are as well funded as the needs demand. We know this will require a shift in power. And this can be scary for some. But God give those full of fear hope that we will come to know your grace so that our hearts will not be hardened to the pain that is all around us. For we worship you, O oh God, with songs of praise. We worship you with words of prayer and with ears that listen for you to speak your saving truth into our lives. We worship you in the silent places where we struggle for hope and for courage. We long for a glimpse of your Holy Spirit, that light that shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. The Holy Spirit that touches and heals the wounded soul, the spirit that gives strength to the weary Grant us your grace, O oh God, a grace to live every moment changed by such love, daring to live with courage, hope, and a love that reflects the life of Jesus, the one whom your light shines in the most unexpected ways. Let us continue to pray together as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. O oh God, we hear the Holy Spirit calling us to serve. Together we will go forth with holy boldness and serve all those who are in need of your transforming love. Amen.
worship service. I invite you to unmute yourselves. Wish everyone a uh, happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. Yes, happy Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Yeah, have a good day. Love everybody. Love everyone. <laughs> be safe. Everybody be safe with the storm coming. <laughs>